sorry about that. I'm just trying to sort my screens out. Um, I take it everyone can see my screens. Uh, my screen is someone just give me a something to say they can. Yeah, we'll see a few thumbs up. Uh, OK, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm James Birchall. I'm a senior engineer in the northwestern central region of Network Rail, working in the drainage and off-track team. Um, and today I want to talk to you about managing surface water um, and what I think would be a more sustainable approach to how we do that at Network Rail. So just to give you some context about um, where I'm coming from and how I formulated my uh, opinions on this, I worked as a drainage designer for about 10 years. Um, about eight years of those I spent in the private sector working on a range of different um, areas, uh, specialising something we call sustainable drainage systems, uh, but doing sort of municipal wide uh, flood risk design, um, residential, commercial. And then towards the end of my time in private consultancy, I did a lot of rail. So um, I was a drainage CRE for Oldsall Cord. Um, I then did a little bit of work on Crossrail, High Speed 2, and some other smaller network rail schemes. Um, and at that point, I thought I may as well dive, dive into it and, and work directly for network rail. So I spent two years in their internal design team, network rail design delivery, um, before moving over into the engineering and asset management uh, side in Northwestern Central. So really, I'm a drainage engineer at heart, but I found a, a really good home for myself um, in the railway sector. So coming, coming into the railway sector, obviously I had a really good appreciation of, of designing uh, drainage and how that would apply uh, in a railway environment. But one of my first schemes when I joined Network Rail Design Delivery was to look at the CP6 work bank for Northwestern Central. And that was a really good introduction for me to sort of see the more operational needs of the railway and the sort of day-to-day -day problems that can occur on the railway. Um, so we we were tasked with looking at about 50 schemes. It got us out on site. You know, we we did a site visit like every week over the course of a year. Um, you can see the sites here spread right across northwestern central. Um, and you know, it, it was really interesting for me getting out on site, talking to TMEs, seeing drainage systems in the ground and how they're performing. And naturally, we found a massive range of problems um, during these schemes. So you had your typical major flooding. You had the obvious lack of maintenance. We had some really interesting geotechnical issues. So uh, this picture here is Kids Grove Station. And what's happened here is they, they used to be mine works in the vicinity. Obviously, when they were mining, they pumped the groundwater down. Um, they've stopped mining and, and the groundwater's risen back up and uh, it's brought this what's called okra with it to the surface, which, which can be really problematic, um, not very nice stuff. Another major thing that I probably didn't appreciate as an external consultant was um, how much the railways uh, constricted over the years. So obviously the sale of land um, can massively affect our drainage systems if part of the drainage system ran through that land. So a lot of times we've sold land that maybe contained our outfall or had an upstream drainage network uh, and we're not in control of the water quality that's coming through that the sediments or, and, and that type of stuff. And also the reduction in track infrastructure. So on our walkouts, we found quite a few locations, particularly in the northwest, where it might have been a four track railway, um, but now it's only two. And what we found was that the drainage was traditionally on the outskirts of the um, railway corridor. And as those two abandoned lines have allowed to vegetate over, which has happened in this case at Erlen, we've become disconnected from our drainage. The drainage has suffered root ingress and we don't have a functioning drainage system. It's still there, but we, we've allowed it to become disconnected from the track infrastructure. And then obviously the age of our infrastructure, I'm sure you can all appreciate that a lot of our infrastructure is 150 to 200 years old. Um, the amount of change that has occurred in that time, obviously we have different designs, design standards now, um, but the, the upstream catchments that some of our culverts, for example, might have to deal with, uh, are very different to when they were built. So uh, a lot of issues uh, in that sort of area as well. So what I really want to um, talk to you today about is what I learned on this, uh, you know, getting out, walking, uh, walking, tracking, 
and looking at drainage systems. And I, I think the, the primary thing for me is that network rail, um, the most common way of managing water on our infrastructure is what, what can be referred to as the traditional approach to drainage. And that traditional approach is getting water, intercepting it as it comes onto your land and trying to con convey it off your land as quickly as possible. And that's, you know, I'll, I'll talk a bit more why that's not always the best uh, solution uh, in a minute. But I, I was really encouraged to see that there's lots of sustainable drainage systems um, components within our infrastructure. So if you look at a typical section of track, there's plenty of ditches, plenty of filter trenches. These are sustainable drainage components, but they're not really integrated into a wider suds approach. And then we did find one or two examples where there was a sort of wider suds approach. Um, so this example here at Hunsbury Hill, what we have is we have cutting slope and we've got a couple of filter trenches that pick up water from that cutting slope. It's taken it to an attenuation basin and then uh, that's supposed to um, control the flow before it goes into a track drainage system. But what we found is that these systems were generally not working. In this example, the flow control device had been removed. There was debris in the basin and it was allow uh, being allowed to vegetate over. So there's obviously a lack of awareness, a lack of um, understanding about what these systems do. So I mentioned the traditional approach to drainage, um, and I think this is a really good uh, example. It's not just drainage, but surface water management in, uh, in, problem, in general. Uh, and you'll see it in towns and cities across the country. So naturally, a, a river sort of meanders its uh, way through the countryside and when it rains it wants to expand uh, and fill the land around it. Over time it will change course, it will meander and this is no good for us when we're building infrastructure. So traditionally what we've tried to do is say right we'll, we'll try and keep take water, put it in an area and keep it, contain it in that area. So we build a nice straight water course, um, build vertical walls up on the side of it and try and contain it and say, you know, we can live with that up to a, a design standard of one in 100 years, one in 200 years. But ultimately, at some point, we have to accept that there's going to be so much water that, you know, we can't control it anymore with that approach. We can only build a wall so high. And when that happens, we start to get uncontrollable flooding. So apart from the obvious with the flooding, this also creates several problems for us. Firstly, we're not really given any um, any emphasis on water quality, amenity, biodiversity. We're taking this lovely natural river and we're lining it with uh, concrete. It's no good for anything apart from managing flood risk. And water is always going to find the weakness. If there's one chink in the armour, if there's one place where you can't protect to that level of standard, water's going to find it. So this example here, you know, the cascade's got bags of capacity but the downstream drainage system doesn't. So we start seeing failures where it all happens at one location. And this, this usually uh, fails where we've got an immovable restriction. So it tends to be bridges over rivers. On the railway, it might be a tunnel portal or an overbridge where we might have drainage in both setters. And then all of a sudden, we have to take it into one set or the six foot to get, to get through this restriction. So we found a really good example of this when we, we were doing our workouts at a, a site that was called Kenyon Tunnel. Kenyon Tunnel is, um, the, at this location, it's, it's on the DSE line between Manchester and Liverpool. Um, and what we have is we have a cutting that's about two miles long. Um, there's a couple of overbridges in that, one being Kenyon Tunnel, um, and then a couple more at Brosley Lane. And what we have here in the downsets of this cutting is a two mile long drainage system no attenuation no flow control device it's just simply conveying over the whole two miles of the site we have a secondary system in the upsess um, and at both overbridges we have to bring this into the downsess to get through these immovable restrictions we do also have a secondary system that runs for a short while in the upsess um, but that's sort of self-serving and what we see at Kenyon Tunnel is we see we we get regular flooding um, at this site at both sets of uh, overbridges over a length of about 400 metres. 
And the reason we get flooding at these locations is because when they electrify the line, they reduce the cover levels uh, to get clearance for the OLE at each of these overbridges. And this means that we've got a dip in our in our track geometry. So when the drainage system surcharges, it surcharges into these uh, dips, these basins in the track. And what's really interesting about Kenyon Tunnel is it's all about conveying down to the uh, down to the outfall. And actually, if you look at the flooding in this two mile cutting, it's all contained with about a quarter of the, the length of the infrastructure. If we actually took that flood volume and spread it over the length of the two miles, we wouldn't see flooding at all. It would be contained within the ballast of the railway. But it's this, this approach of um, traditional drainage, convey, 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 that has got us into this, this problem. So I was really lucky to get out to Kenyon Tunnel um, last year when it was actually flooded. Uh, so this was in Storm Derrick. This was the day after Storm Derrick. Um, and you can see the picture here. Um, you can see that the, the up line is totally underwater uh, and the down line isn't much better. And all these pictures were taken on the same day, uh, a walkout of about three or four hours. And you can see um, this is one of the channels that discharges into our railway system. There's so much capacity available in that channel that's not being used while our railway uh, while our railway sits on the water. This is the problem with traditional drainage. It all passes it down to the weakest point. Similarly, if you just ignore the, the landslip that's occurred here, you can see the flooding is right in the distance past that red light. If we took that volume of water and spread it out across the infrastructure, it would not cause us to close the railway in the way that this flood event has. And this is what we need to start thinking about with um, our traditional drainage systems. So what I really want to do is talk to you about sustainable drainage systems, because this is my area of expertise. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of in the railway industry, there's a lot of um, scepticism about sustainable drainage systems because people think we don't have the space. I think people start thinking about suds components like ponds and tanks and start saying, well, we, we can't fit them in. And I want to dispel that myth that it's all about ponds and tanks because it, it's really not. It's about principles of a drainage system. So the key principle is that we, we want to look at the drainage system and at every opportunity we want to maximise benefits that we can derive in four key areas and there quality, quantity, amenity and biodiversity. So obviously, I think everyone can appreciate why we want to manage the quantity of water that we're trying to deal with. But quality is just as important. I see a lot of drainage systems where we don't manage quality and it causes blockages, which causes failure. And it's very difficult for us to get in and maintain our drainage systems. And that's why managing quality is imperative. Similarly, amenity. There was a massive uproar a few years ago regarding uh, cut, cutting down of uh, trees on the railway in the, in the national papers. And out of the back of that, we had the Valley Review, which put an emphasis on biodiversity. If we can provide that through our drainage systems, it actually becomes an opportunity when project, projects are delivering works to provide biodiversity benefits, to provide flood risk benefits too. And it, it shows the importance of amenity and biodiversity to our um, passengers and our, our line side neighbours. So how do we do this? There's a, a three key ways, really. Firstly, we want to mimic the natural processes. If water's draining in a certain way um, for the past hundred or so thousand years, we want to keep it uh, doing that as much as possible. If we can maximise infiltration, evaporation, transpiration over wide areas, we need to do that. Let's stop trying to get water and capture it and convey it away when, when there's other methods of dealing with it, because it will reduce the amount of water that ultimately we have to manage. Where possible, we want to keep water on or close to the surface. So it's much better being in a ditch than a pipe because you can see the water, you can see any blockages, it's easier to access to maintain. Um, you're dealing with atmospheric pressure instead of hydraulic pressure. And if there's a blockage, typically water will flow around it and re-enter your drainage system. When we start having pipe systems, the pipes don't always follow the contours. So if there's a blockage, it will back up and it will come out where it can. And that's not necessarily where you want it to go. 
Finally, we want to manage the rainfall where it lands. If we if we deal with it where it lands, we deal with it over the widest area possible. That encourages us to increase infiltration, evaporation, transpiration, and allows us to create loads of little systems, loads of little systems of managing localized systems of managing water. So I, I think suds creates a really a uh, really resilient form of drainage because what we're doing is we're creating loads of little systems of drainage. We're creating loads of little pins, and it's a bit like a plunk. If we lose one pin because we've got small little pockets of water, you know, we might drop a ball, maybe two, but we're not going to get this catastrophic flooding event because one system failed. Whereas with the traditional drainage system, if we only have one, one item holding up that, that flood volume, and if that fails, we start seeing catastrophic failures. Um, so it, it's a lot more resilient in that sense. So a lot of people sort of, I mentioned before, sort of say they think of techniques and think, well, they don't fit in the railway environment. I've heard that a lot in network rail. But I actually think the railways, you know, a fantastic place for suds because traditionally it was built with suds techniques before people even realised what suds was. So if you look at the cross section of a railway, you usually we have a ditch or a filter trench on the boundary. We then have an earthwork, which is usually vegetated which is essentially a filter strip. Our track bed is angular stone that interlocks and creates voids. That's just the permeable pavement. And then we line it with filter trenches on either side. Worst case scenario of our drainage system fails, our cess is lower than our track. So we've got a natural exceedance route as well. And then add to that that the, the railway is generally laid on a flat gradient. It's perfect for holding large volumes of water. It won't run off. Um, at, at really quick rates, it will it will hold in place a little bit. So we're, we're not far off from turning the existing infrastructure into a sub system, but I, I think what we need is we just need to start applying controls. So one of the things I didn't see any of when we were on our uh, site walkouts, we didn't see any controls of, of water. And I think that's where we need to start acting. Um, and the one control we did say had been removed, so um, tells it all. So what are controls? Controls are really simple structures generally in drainage. They they don't take much. Um, they don't have any operation. They're not they're not complex. Um, and you can see the importance of them in this this diagram here. So this is a check dam which we use in um, ditches, water courses, and the idea being that when you have a slope, uh, water will run to the bottom, bottom of the slope. And if you have a structure that holds water back, you know, you, the slope will mean that uh, eventually you'll get to a point where you can't hold any more. If you put another dam in, you repeat the amount of storage you get and you keep following that process up your drainage system. But they're great for water quality as well, because this is going to allow slow flow underneath it. As water builds up behind it, it's going to encourage sediments to settle and drop out. It's going to catch plants, deb twigs, debris, uh, leaves, stop them from getting into your pipe systems. These are really important structures. We can also apply these in our drainage systems as well. We can put uh, flow control devices uh, such as orifice, hydro brakes as well, and they'll they'll do a similar um, have a similar effect on um, attenuation in pipe systems. I should just uh, point out this this. This check dams in construction. Uh, we would like to see this vegetated as well, um, but like I say, this was a construction photo um, and due to be uh, seeded after. So we also need to make sure that we take every opportunity um, to get the little wins, the marginal gains that add up into the big picture, because I, I think what we see in the railway is we keep nibbling away. There's something called urban creep where you keep keep adding small volumes and eventually they build up into something big and we need to start reverse engineering that. So a few examples of that. This is an earthwork regrade we did at a site called Blackthorn in Piddington, same location where that uh, check dam was installed actually. Um, and this is a rock fill earth, um, earth, earthwork extension and it was an environment, environment agency condition that we had to plant 
had to plant this as part of the works. But it's actually really good from a surface water management perspective. If you consider how much water will land on that, sit on leaves, slowly work its way down into the roots, get absorbed by the root system, it's going to slow runoff from, from this earthwork compared to if it was left as a stone structure. Um, one of the sites we found on our walkouts was this really simple water butt. There was two of these on this uh, station and it just takes a little bit water, uh, a little bit of water away that we don't have to manage. And this was used by local residents um, that managed the friends of, of the station group uh, to water a little garden that was uh, built alongside it. And then I've also got a permeable pavement, which I designed at Autosol Cord. Um, water that lands on this will go down between little gaps in the blocks and it rather than a a uh, tightly bound type one subgrade. We have a type three angular stone um, and that has little voids in it that water can fill up and attenuate in. And what we actually have here is we have a pipe system under draining it. And then the railway discharges into that pipe system. Water will back up and it will attenuate in the sub base of this this uh, pavement as well. So really simple steps we can do. And you'll notice none of these really take any land. They don't take, we don't have to buy land to do this. We're just, we're, we're nibbling away. We're not, we're not taking from uh, other disciplines or taking anything off the railway or making it unusable. We're just working with what we've got. So in, invariably, we will have situations on the railway where there is just too much water coming from land external to, uh, to ourselves. And I think people think we we need to buy big areas of land to buy ponds and it's not really the case. We do actually have a lot of space out there that is not being used, um, particularly in the northwest. We noticed loads of old track that had been decommissioned. And, and this example here in Garstang on the West Coast Main Line, you know, you I think it was about a mile, a mile and a half long this section. Um, and actually, we're trying to contain our drainage in a 300 mil pipe. Um, alongside the track bed when we've got all this space, we've got all this space to manage water, um, but we're just not using it. So we, we need to start using this space and thinking differently about how we how we capture water and where we put it. And I get that people will probably be thinking, well, you don't want to just turn this into a bog and we don't have to. Again, um, Kenyan Tunnel, we've got, we, we recognize an area of land next to the track here where it was an access, it was an old siding. This was our secondary outfall that I mentioned before. It discharges off past that van. And what we realised here was there, there was an area where we can store water temporarily. This this photo was again taken during Storm Derrick. Um, and we thought it's much better water sitting here than in the trap bed. So what we've done is we've allowed this manhole to flood. It can flood out through gaps in the manhole rings and it can flood out into this area here. And this is effectively a permeable pavement. There's gaps in these stones that can fill it with water. And you can see it's actually working. It's filled with water. And there's a reverse slope on this. So water, once the water level in the pipe system goes down, this water will just re-enter the drainage system. So it's not going to sit there for weeks or months. It's going to sit there for hours and then re-enter the system. Yet you can still drive on it. You can still access this railway. You know, we've again, we've not taken any way, anything away from the operation of the railway by providing somewhere for water to sit. So another technique that I think we really have to think about is actually disrupting flows rather than just working with water, trying to keep it on its path and get it out of our infrastructure as quickly as possible. We need to think about its flow path. This here is a technique called contour logs, and this this isn't a railway site. This is a, this is a, a Hardcastle Crags near Hebden Bridge, which suffers really badly for, from flooding. And the point is here about slowing water down. So water on this really steep slope wants to concentrate. It wants to sort of get together um, and get going down the slope, build up depth, build up velocity. And as soon as it does does that, it hits a log. It's forced two ways. Parallel to the parallel to the slope, which will slow it down, and it will make it will make the water meander its whole way down that slope. That's really going to reduce the time it takes to concentrate at the bottom. This is this is great as well because what it does 
it slows water down. It's, it gives it more time to evaporate. It gives it more time to infiltrate. It's less likely to scour. Um, so there's loads of benefits of this type of approach. You contrast this to the picture on the right. I'm sorry, it's a bit small, but what we've got here is we've got uh, a ditch at the top of the railway cutting and uh, a cascade. This is a concrete canvas ditch, by the way. And what's happened here is the farm's been freshly ploughed. There's been a, an exceedance event, a heavy um, rainfall event. And you can see the flow path that water has taken through this field, facilitated by the direction it's been ploughed. But there's a natural flow path directly towards our um, cascade. And what's really interesting here is that that cascade's obviously been put there because there was a natural concentration feature there. And they've just tried to work with that. They've tried to work with the existing flow. However, if they had applied an approach like this and split and, and blocked the flow from coming down here, you would have sent it parallel to the slope. You would have slowed it down. And all this, 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 um, this failure here, what happened is a lot of sediment got down to track level. You can see it's it smashed open the catch pit. Um, it's filled the drainage system. It's filled the track ballast. And I believe there was a slight derailment here as well. So say we put something in to set, send the water both ways and we could bring it down in two, maybe more. We could half the amount of flow getting down to track level at each location. You'd, you'd lower your velocity because you've sent it uh, each way and hopefully you would allow some of the, set, uh, the sediment to settle out. How about rather than concrete canvas, we actually vegetated that ditch and created some roughness, slowed water down again. And we would have uh, we would have even more examples. Uh, we would have had more settlement of water of the sediment and stopped it getting down to track level. Thirdly, what if we put a check dam in and we put a physical barrier to stop that sediment getting down to track level? We wouldn't have had this failure at all. We wouldn't have to go and clean our drainage system and we wouldn't have to re replace the ballast. We would have to clean out the ditch, but that is a lot easier to do than cleaning out a buried drainage system. And this is why we need to start thinking about such principles when we design drainage, even in this, even in this restricted environment. And finally, I, I think the biggest thing for us at the moment is that we, we're starting to look at drainage on a catchment level. And when you look at a catchment level, you see the railway is just a tiny little sliver through a, a, a massive catchment. And the biggest opportunity for us at the moment lies with outside, lies outside of our boundary. So now when we start working outside of, of our boundary, it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be more sustainable, and it's going to be much easier to maintain because we don't have these track access restrictions. And what we're finding at the moment in our region is that there's loads of people that want to help or that can be incentivized to help. So the Environment Agency, um, they're really they're really encouraging us to um, work with them at the moment, and, and we're really keen to work with them, deliver some combined schemes that not only look after what we're trying to do for the railway, but also provide wider benefits too. Um, and a lot of those benefits will be delivered off track, which will be cheaper for us. Uh, we've also been talking to water companies uh, because they have a responsibility for flooding and lead local flood authorities too. And then we're really making a lot of ground as well with Rivers Trusts um, who have really good links with landowners um, and can start actually changing, changing our approach to managing water off our track. I think historically what, what has been tried is saying we have a problem, we're going to go and buy land and we're going to deal with our problem. Um, and that, that usually doesn't go down well with the existing landowners. Um, because they don't want to sell their land. Whereas what the Rivers Trusts are doing, are they're putting us in touch with people that actually want to deliver natural flood management and they're connecting us with opportunities to solve our problems and improve our resilience. Uh, so that's working really well for us at the moment. So how could we apply these, these principles to a site like Kenyon Tunnel? So the first thing that we would look to do is break this system down we were getting all our flooding at Brosley Lane because it's the, the bottom end of the system and there's so much water being chucked at it, it just can't, can't keep up. So we actually did this. We spotted an opportunity to put UTX in um, and, and we did this 
within a couple of weeks, we got a design out there um, and we thought this will at least buy us some time uh, to help this really vulnerable part of the network until we can get a proper renewal in here. And when we had Storm Derrick and half of the country, half of the Northwest was underwater, Rosalie Lane did not flood because we had this UTX installed and it worked really well. We still had flooding at Kenyon Tunnel, um, but it shows that actually it was the water coming from upstream that was causing the problem at Broseley Lane. So that was the first step, break it down into two smaller systems. If we do get an event where water starts ponding out, pooling out here, there's still, it could overflow. And that's the beauty of suds. You create these resilience. If you get a failure here, it can still flow out this way. Secondly, we, we need to identify these pinch points and we need to start working back, um, slowing water down in the upper reaches of our drainage system, using the whole site to our advantage. When we were on site during Storm Derrick, if you walked to the catch pit here, whilst the uh, track was underwater, it wasn't even full of water. The, the drainage system had plenty of capacity inherent online storage that was not being utilised. So we need to slow water down in this upper reach of our drainage system too. And then finally, we need to go and talk to the local landowners. Uh, the ditch I showed earlier, that's this ditch here. It'd be easy for us to uh, stick a dam in there, encourage water to back up um, if we can get permission of the landowner. There's quite a few opportunities in flows on the site where we could do that. And that's what we need to need to do. With Kenyon Tunnel, I've, I think it's also worth pointing out that this isn't an insignificant pipe size in this drainage system. I think it's 400, 500 mil pipes. There's not really capacity to increase conveyance. So the only way to solve this problem is to work backstream and slow water down. And I, I think this, this example, um, which is a site called Cornwall Gardens, I believe is in Lewisham, is a really good example of the difference in approach between traditional drainage and sustainable drainage. So I'm sure everyone will recognise this type of uh, concrete channel river. It's nice and smooth, it's disconnected from uh, the surrounding landscape. And what I love about this example is we've got that immovable restriction in the background, a brick arch railway. I don't know why they did this scheme, whether it was due to scour, whether it was due to um, capacity issues at that bridge. But you can see what they've done is work back and try to solve the, the problem. They've created roughness. Um, they've allowed the river to flood outwards rather than upwards, which will reduce velocity. Um, this is going to capture twigs, debris, sticks that might block in, well, branches that might block in that, um, in that bridge during a storm event. Uh, it's great for amenity, it's great for biodiversity, so it's ticking all the boxes, quantity, quality, amenity, biodiversity. And I just want to leave you with a picture of contrasting that to how we work on the railway. This is the type of renewal I'm used to seeing on um, my Connect LinkedIn, where it's just all about function. It's all about getting water away as quickly as possible. This concrete canvas is looking to convey water as quickly as possible. There's no control. Think about what happens when water goes off the edge of that slope. It's gonna, it's gonna reach really high velocities, cause scour issues if we don't start holding the water back. There's no biodiversity, sorry, there's no quality, there's no amenity, there's no biodiversity improvements here. It's gonna increase runoff, so there's no quality improvement, quantity improvements either. And you contrast that to our Black Fawn in Piddington example, where you know we've got quality, we've got quantity, we've got amenity, we've got biodiversity, and you know we've got added to that we've got the uh, check dams as well. So um, yeah, that's me. Um, I guess we open the floor to questions. That was uh, fascinating, James. Many thanks. Um, so we've got a few questions in the chat. So. I'll start from the top. So first from Richard Hellings, James, with regards to vegetation to increase suds, can introducing new species to a catchment improve suds characteristics, e.g. planting conifers to improve water retention on the on the tree and encourage evaporation? Yeah, so th there is um, certain species, I'm, I'm not an expert in that field, but um, I know there are studies that look at 
different types of trees and um, where where is best to employ them. Um, but it, it's not even just all about trees. So um, peat bogs as well. Great example of, of, you know, they hold water, hold back water up on the moors above our railways. You know, you think the peat district and, and the lakes, there's plenty of opportunity to hold water back there as well. Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I think Rick's trying to lead me into a question, question there that he knows the answer to. Um, OK, thanks. Uh, next from uh, from Patrick. James, do you have an example of swales and check dams that are operational on the railway land? Um, so this is a hard one. Um, so the check dams at Blackthorn and Pidd Piddington are definitely operational. They're the only ones I can think of at the moment. Unfortunately, they're working in a uh on an embankment which is probably not the best example um but we are looking at ways we can deploy these techniques in northwest and central um and obviously it's it's a bit of a slow process we're, we're designing stuff now that hopefully will be in operation in a few years time um but yeah there's definitely some at blackthorn in Piddington. in terms of swales i can't think of a swale but there's plenty of ditches out there um and i, I think this is the thing with suds it's it's actually already there uh, people just don't recognise it as such, but th there's plenty of examples out there. Uh, well, Richard, uh, yeah, followed up. Peak forest cut into Great Rocks Tunnel, Bentham Gate Road near Dove's Hole. That is given the reference. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, that is a good example, actually. So um, what, what we have at Peak Rocks, um, it is a really interesting site, actually, loads of uh, geological issues with the um, quarries there, and we're getting really um, high sediment runoff in that. It's, it's got calcium in it from the quarry, um, which basically in our pipe systems, it, it turns to concrete, essentially. Um, so they've actually installed some swales there that are working really well in providing that sort of suds type uh, solution, open drainage, which is a lot less susceptible to blockage from this calcium so thanks for it thanks for that and uh next from tom wilson um also chair of glasgow section following rail privatization 1995 track drainage maintenance was largely reallocated as low priority task and often ignored entirely because it was resource heavy and not seen as good value following the comments accidents in, in network rail now reprioritizing drainage management funding in-house cleaning and in parallel encouraging discussion with railway neighbours to conduct ditching and debris removal of the railway drainage outfall pathways oh. um so yeah I, I think you're right uh, a lot a lot of the drainage infrastructure is has kind of got lost forgotten covered over by vegetation um I wouldn't say it since Carmen. We, we've been doing this for the past few years since the start of CP6, but we've got a big activity undergoing to find all our drainage, um, to survey it, get the conditions so we can actually start being a lot more proactive in our maintenance of it. Our next question from Mark Stell, uh, I think it's in regards to the, the slide you had earlier. Did you also ask the farmer to plough the field parallel to the railway? rather than perpendicular? Um, so that example wasn't in Northwestern Central. Um, that example was actually up in Scotland. So it, it's not something we've asked them to do. I've looked at the route view from that and that field has been ploughed that way, you know, for years. Um, I think what's taken them by surprise is that just the timing of the rainfall event coinciding um, with the ploughing is, is what's really caught them out. But I think it comes down to the sorts of principles you should think about water quality um we can't control what the landowner do does so we we have to sort of make sure we have robust systems uh, be because you know the farm farmer could sell his land and a new farmer could come in and start plowing it the other way anyway so um we need we need robust systems so that uh, and richard's also given a reply back to tom it's quite a long re reply um yeah about going back to age gill in 1995 um yeah 2012 saw a large number of landslides northwest 
yeah, led to the enormous schemes going in in T-Bay, Sharp, Risewell, Hills. Yeah. Um, next question from Mike Evans. Can debris screens be considered a suds measure? Uh, I guess they they can. Um, I think if you've got good sub, suds, hopefully you, you shouldn't need debris screens because the point of suds is that you're trying to manage water quality. Um, I'm not going to say that there's never going to be an occasion where you don't need a debris screen in a sud system. Um, but yeah, do you know, the idea, do you know, for example, you could meander your water course um, upstream of a culvert to encourage sediments or uh, large items to settle out on, on the bends of the water um, and not get down to uh, your culvert. Um, but sometimes it is, it is necessary to put that trash screen in, but they really should be a last resort. Um, thanks for that. Um, yeah, next question from Tom. Uh, do, do you want to read out your question, Tom? Um, this is about your meeting uh, yesterday, wasn't it? Thanks for allowing me to unmute. Yeah, so we, we had a presentation by uh, Sen Steve at the Glasgow section last night. And one of the things they touched on that they can remotely monitor, or that they would hope to remotely monitor in the future, is out the flow at outfalls. Obviously, if you have a recorded flow at an outfall, it increases, decreases, depending on whether it's raining or not. But you would also have a, a trigger value where once you get to the situation where the outflow is being overwhelmed, in other words, water backing up, that would be the chance to go and have a look at that system before it gets to the flooding situation to see if it is a local blockage to be rectified or whether it's just the sheer volume of water. So Sense Eve were quite keen to get um, interest between uh, themselves and Network Real to get that kind of remote monitoring system up and running to maybe take an existing flow calculator and instrument it such that it is reporting back to a network. Is that something that Network Real should be putting their weight behind? Uh, yeah, definitely. So there's there's loads of different sort of systems uh that are doing this sort of thing so we're we're talking with um i forget the name of them um harmer i think it is um about level sensors um for i, I mean the the problem we have at the moment is that we don't have a, a good enough asset knowledge to know what the capacity of our drainage systems are um but what we're looking at at the moment is just simple level sensors so we can start seeing what's the normal level in that drainage system, how high it goes, um, what sort of corresponds to uh, flooding. Um, but also things like if we start seeing that that level sensor is permanently tilted, we might be able to see there's a blockage in the pipe. Um, so we need to do some research about how many of these level sensors you would need in the drainage system and and how they interact. And But there, there are examples out there. Um, so yeah, we're we're trying to build that into a more coordinated system at the moment. That's why, in the interest of keeping costs down, maybe a single sensor at the outfall to record typical flows at the outfall, which would increase and then decrease as rainstorms come and go. But then there would be a trigger value set when, you know, there's, it's time now to go and have a look at that. Yeah, it, an instrument the system. If you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very uh, dynamic, and I think the the difficulty becomes when you start then putting emphasis on maintenance to go out and look at stuff during storm events. Whereas at the moment we're we're taking more the view that we want to be proactive in our maintenance. So when the storm event comes, we know that our drainage systems don't have blockages, for example. Um, so therefore, if none of them are tilting, we know that that's a free flowing drainage system. Um, uh, you know, essentially. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, next question from Patrick. As a designer, it's very difficult to do calculations to achieve discharge constraints for this type of drainage. What guidance do you recommend? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to read that question and understand. 
I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not really really sure what the uh, questions are asking. It's quite quite broad there. Um, I mean, I, I think in terms of, um, I think that that comes to basically how conservative do you be in sort of natural flood management and how how much infiltration you get, how much. It is a very difficult field to know, um, to quantify um, the reductions in runoff that you might get, say, for example, from vegetating um, the earthwork. I, th I think it comes about comes down to reasonable um reasonable judgment uh, about discharge rates and you know impermeable areas and um runoff values essentially sorry i don't you know it's quite a broad question i i'm happy to talk further with patrick if he's got any specifics or any sites that he wants to to look at Yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, have you got any uh, particular sites, Patrick? I want to come off mute. Um, no, uh, well, I did this as various sites I could talk about. Uh, it is just the problem of actually quantifying how the this type of drainage will reduce flows because people want to see actual figures. Um, um, I, I mean, in, in, in the more practical sense, so say you put a flow flow control rate um on a pipe system i think that's really easy to quantify um yeah yeah you know you, you're modeling your pipe system you put an orifice on it that that one's really easy and that that's what we're mainly trying to do i, f I think um in terms of runoff values and that yeah it's you know it's down to the judgment of the engineer but you could quite easily change your uh, impermeable area values to to accommodate that that's all very well, but when you've got a drainage system and you're, you're sat there with your IDC and people are asking you, is this really going to work? Can you guarantee it? And you say, well, yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, it, it's difficult to, uh, to, yeah, to argue. I, I appreciate that. And um, I think a lot of what we're trying to do at a region um, scale at the moment is trying to get those examples um, that we can show people that they do work. And I, I think one of the we we just had a, a sort of Sunday in the northwestern central region uh, talking about these schemes and one of the things that came up to me is that there's a lot of you know there's one or two examples of suds that have not really worked and everyone sort of has the exception that the idea doesn't work um but no one thinks that about traditional drainage because we've got sites like Kenyon Tunnel they still seem to think that sticking pipes in work so it, it's it's trying to change mindsets and cultures that all these small little interventions will stack up to a big, big benefit. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, and I think ultimately, you know, back on the basis of the, of the value review, we've got another reason to do it um, because we've got to provide biodiversity net gain uh, going forward. Yeah, I think the uh, the sort of the drainage people within Network Rail that I'm dealing with are very keen on it, but uh, you know it's it's not you know, it's not not widespread, and people they're very nervous about it. But, uh, Definitely. Yeah, thanks very much. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll no get worries. in touch. <laughs> yeah, do do get in touch. Uh, thanks. For that I'll I'll just tie into Toby's comment there. Is there any areas where we have to be careful applying suds? So top of cuttings, high risk earthworks outside etc so um yeah this is where i want to go back to the point suds isn't this big scary thing that we need to be careful of it's about looking at the drainage system and what's the best most sustainable solution and my opinion is what's the alternative to a sustainable drainage system what you're saying you want to put an unsustainable drainage system in no one's saying you have to infiltrate at the top of cuttings or at high risk sites you know you've got to be practical uh, but you've just got to apply those principles. You've got to say, what's the best way of managing water in this location? Uh, thanks for that. Um, Michael, do you want to uh, talk through your comments, your question? Sorry. If you, if you can unmute. I, um, <clears throat> this one, yeah, it's just a question for James. I think um, I just... Um, or asking it now rather than 
um, another time, just because the, the aerial photograph that you showed of the um, the washout from the field um, that had um, you know that had um, been created at the bottom of the uh, cascade drain. I think you know I've noticed on a few earthworks schemes because I'm a geotechnical design engineer within an RDD and I know James fairly well. Um, we see a lot of earthworks that are adversely affected by drainage that was installed or altered uh, following construction of newer roads, whether that's over or under the railway. Um, and quite often the drainage that has been installed at the time of the construction of that road um, hasn't been maintained since. Um, and then that's created problems for the earthworks. I mean, I think the answer probably relates specifically to some schemes that I'm working on. Um, but the question is, do you, do you proactively identify these sites that rely on drainage um, from highways, other highways or authorities? And um, do you hold them to account for, you know, not maintaining or maintaining these the, the drainage systems that we rely on? Um, so, I, th I think this is where SUDS becomes more important, Mike, because um, what I'm trying to get at is when we just have conveyance systems, we're really vulnerable to changes um, to that system. Where we have this SUDS, then you have this overlapping approach, you get more resilience because you've got loads of little pocket systems that provide resilience to a change because we, we can't. We can't police the whole railway for changes that might happen upstream of our infrastructure. Um, so I, I guess in you know, where we where we where we have those sort of events, yeah, we will look to um, to get them rectified. But you know, they usually I, I don't think we're proactive in uh, identifying them now. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question, Michael. Um, yeah, so uh, Tony has put on uh, for General Info Network Rail published first drainage manual in 2010 and first drainage asset management policy 2014. The initial national asset surveys commenced in 2011 and it's been challenging to establish reliable asset inventory. Um, yeah, and as Richard says, uh, all the re our sessions are recorded and available for PWI members on the website and the links in the chat. Uh, Schwab has asked, uh, you mentioned about dams located in cess areas to manage water. How uh, sustainable are these? Are these being used more often to avoid further flooding and keep the rail track protected? Uh, so it wouldn't be a dam you locate in the cess area. Um, it's more that in your filter trench system, you could put, um, flow control devices in those to sort of back water up through the drainage system and create online storage. So that might be a hydro break or an orifice in the drainage system or even a restriction in your pipe size. Um, the dams would be more in your ditches that would be in your, your sort of line side uh, off track areas. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I just wanted Richard, do you want to come off mute and give your uh, I think you've given a response as well to Michael. Yeah, um, really good question, Michael. Um, um, we've had um, a number of, um, uh, just give you a bit of context, I work in drainage off track myself in London North Western. I work with James quite often in a lot of schemes. Now, um, James uh, was involved in a scheme um, where we had a developer which um, decided to put a drainage system on the very, very crest of our um, uh, rock cutting at a place called Brunswick Terrace. And um, James was involved in the um, uh, consultation um, where they wanted to put a, um, a soak away at the uh, rocky cutting. And when he looked uh, quite de in detail at it, it looked like, well, it soaked away well because it was um, it was a combination of sandstone and it was also uh, washing out the material from behind the sandstone cutting and it was spilling out of the wheat poles on the side of a track. So putting something like that in would have led the um, uh, asset to become an awful lot more uh, vulnerable. So um, um, 
bit of discussion with them and local planning authority, et cetera. Um, and we actually managed to get them to change their design, which was good. So it is good, but the, the main issue that we have with uh, getting um, policing the railway as is, um, we're not a statutory consultee for planning authorities and lead local flood authorities don't set the tone for planning authorities. Now, planning authorities obviously get um, quite a lot of uh, funding through um, development, etc. And so they're under a high amount of, um, um, they, they want to get as much um, development in as possible. Um, in terms of um, our consultation on it, we're not always consulted. Sometimes we are, and generally local authorities are pretty good in uh, working with us. But like I say, it, it involves us being consulted in the first place, and it's um, getting harder and harder to actually see what's going on on and around the railway as we move more towards track worker safety, and there's uh, less eyes and ears walking around on the track. I, th I think, Rick, just to add to that, that, that example you've just raised as well, we only found out about that by pure accident, didn't we? I think someone yeah. noticed the construction going on on Jiren and someone in asset protection and sort of raised it up. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was very lucky we found that rather than, um, you know, robust processes. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, um, yeah, it's, it's by chance more often than design, unfortunately. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think, um, you know, part of the question was related to, you know, assets that have probably long since been forgotten about, you know, say drains at the toe of embankments that, you know, when a road had been put under the railway, um, the outfall instead of following the, the, the toe of the embankment to the low point where the river passes, it's had to dog leg and meet the river at, at the, you know, perpendicular to the railway. And that outfall or that dog leg that's been put in due to the construction of the road has been forgot about, not maintained. And 50 years later, the embankment fails. And part of the embankment drainage, the embankment renewal scheme would be to reinstate that drainage um, or you know maintain that drainage. But because it's long since been forgotten about, a new drainage system has to be put in. So it's... Uh, I mean, I've got a few specific examples that, I mean, I'll contact you separately and talk them yeah, through. If you want to, I mean, you probably find um, with, uh, uh, as we do, that you end up playing detective quite often. I think yeah. this is where our, our uh, I don't know, our mapping of our assets is, is going to help as well, Mike. I don't know, obviously there's a lot of being, work being done to actually understand where our assets are, uh, because like you say, a lot of them, we don't even realise they're there until we start finding a problem. Yeah. OK, uh, many thanks for that. And uh, that was a really fascinating presentation, James. Um, I suppose Thank I can you. relate. When I started my career quite early on, I, I worked uh, particularly in highways in, in Australia and Suds was quite prevalent there. But obviously they they have a lot more space and they, they used to talk a lot about swales. And um, yeah, it's really fascinating, I suppose, to, as designers understanding, um, you know, this new approach and those techniques, as you say, trying to keep the water alongside, uh, you know, upstream. Uh, and also fascinating how you're talking about talking with other, speaking with other authorities, um, you know, like the Rivers Trust and and, and access to other land and a, a very, yeah, it's very enlightening. Uh, many thanks. Um, so for those online, can we please give our vote of thanks in the normal manner? OK, um, we'll just.